You simply can't fight your physiology. The reality is, if you want to run faster and further, you need to match it with just as much recovery. Stick to your old habits and you'll end up overtrained and most likely injured. Luckily, research can help us runners identify the most effective and efficient recovery methods to save you time and help you achieve running feats you wouldn't be able to reach simply by training harder. To help illustrate the most effective methods, I've drawn inspiration from Professor Shona Halson, who I interviewed on the Run Smarter podcast and introduced me to the recovery pyramid. However, I've made a few little tweaks here and there to move away from Shona's advice tailored to the general athlete and more to suit you Run Smarter scholars. The recovery pyramid works like this. Each of these four tiers contains different recovery methods based on their effectiveness and importance. And if you want to perform at your best, you'll need to master the lower levels before working your way up. Let's start at the top, which is dedicated to recovery methods that don't have any evidence or have evidence showing little to no benefit. At the very peak, we have fads such as handheld devices like massage guns and electrotherapy devices such as TENS machines. Some of these are accompanied with flashy marketing and seems to be backed by evidence, but a lot of these companies that design non-medical grade devices aren't held to the same scrutiny as companies building medical grade devices. As a result, they can cherry pick evidence or can conduct their own dodgy studies and market it as science backed. Take the hard work done by Paul Ingram over on painscience.com. When researching massage guns, Paul says the only available scientific review on vibration therapy for muscle soreness is just junk science and completely useless. But my opinion can change as well as new evidence is released. So I won't personally attack any specific brand or specific product. And I have changed my opinion in the past. A perfect example is the use of foam rollers, which I've only recently promoted slightly further down this pyramid. And it's because of brand new systematic reviews such as this, which identified four studies showing that foam rolling has a small benefit on muscle soreness and it only found one study saying it's on par with passive rest. Unfortunately though, they didn't really comment on how much foam rolling was needed to get these small benefits. You'll also find something similar if you go looking into stretching as a recovery method. This systematic review compiled people stretching between 300 to 600 seconds and found after 72 hours, there was a benefit of two points on a 100 point scale. The paper commented that for most, this effect is way too small and not really worthwhile. But I do recognize that some people stretch and feel great afterwards. And also it's really quick and easy to do. So if you find a personal benefit, keep it in. Just don't add it in and take time and energy away from the bottom two tiers of this recovery pyramid. I'll get to that shortly. But first, let's cover the next tier, which is an active recovery. As Shona mentioned, it could be something like walking or biking or moving around in the pool or anything that is just low intensity. And this is to help circulate the blood and get the joints moving. However, it should be short about 10 to 20 minutes, and it should be low intensity without accumulating any additional stress or fatigue. Importantly though, this type of recovery has its biggest impact if you need to bounce back in a short period of time. For example, if you had back-to-back -back hard workouts or if you had back-to-back -back races, this is for you. However, if you're just completing a hard session on a Tuesday, and then it's followed by a rest day on Wednesday and then an easy run on Thursday, this active recovery method can still be helpful but becomes less important. The next two tiers, however, really ramp up in terms of necessity. It's time to talk about adequate nutrition and hydration required for recovery. Running faster and further requires more energy, energy that the body cannot just create spontaneously. Instead, it extracts energy from your food and other energy stores in the body. If you can also stay hydrated, this will help provide enough fluid in the body to transport these vital nutrients. 
get this balance wrong and increase your training without the nutritional building blocks, you enter a situation where input just doesn't equal output. If this goes on long enough, your body will desperately look for other ways it can extract energy. In extreme cases, your body has the ability to extract minerals away from your bones and your organs, which severely disrupts their functioning. As a result, this increases the likelihood of a bone stress fracture, abnormal or absent menstrual cycles, poor hormonal functions, and other severe consequences. This is a condition called relative energy deficiency in sport, or RED-S for short. While this is an extreme example, this goes to show that a balance in nutrition is so, so important. So when you're accumulating high mileage and building up an appetite, don't just give in to sugar cravings and eat cakes and chocolate and junk food. Instead, give your body a good balance of nutrient dense foods and provide the necessary building blocks to restore the balance between training and recovery. Now you're probably looking at this pyramid and thinking, Brody, what about massages? I don't see that anywhere. Let me explain. Massage can have really powerful effects, but despite what you might have been told, massage does not release knots, remove lactic acid, improve circulation, or remove trigger points. You can head to the painscience.com website if you want to really dive into this rabbit hole. But it's undeniable that some people feel incredible after a massage. Well, this may be placebo, or it could have powerful stress relief effects, which is a perfect time to reveal the final tier, which contains downtime and sleep. Let's start with sleep. This cannot be underestimated. Christy Ashwanden authored the book, Good To Go, How To Eat, Sleep and Rest Like A Champion, and says that the benefits of sleep cannot be overstated. It is hands down the most powerful recovery tool known to science. You could add together every other recovery aid ever discovered and it wouldn't stack up. Research also shows that inefficient sleep has a significant detrimental impact on athletic performance. And some studies have shown that adolescents that sleep less than eight hours were 70% more likely to sustain an injury compared to those sleeping more than eight hours. So prioritizing good quality sleep is the best thing you can do. What you want to avoid is reprioritizing this pyramid, say waking up 30 minutes earlier, just to do some stretches and foam rolling. If you wanted to enhance your recovery, research suggests staying in bed and sleeping that extra 30 minutes instead. If it's tough to get the required sleep overnight, your next option, if you have the luxury, is to squeeze in naps during the day. Try to aim for 20 to 60 minutes between 2 and 4 p.m. and doing so will avoid disrupting your normal circadian rhythm. But if naps aren't practical for you, the good news is you can fall back to these recovery methods that involves downtime. When we exercise, we have certain exercise hormones that ramp up our fight or flight response. If you then go from exercise into a stressful environment such as work or family dramas, these same hormones are still circulating and the body fails to enter recovery mode. So we need to combat this by actively seeking out downtime. And this is where massage can help alongside meditation, saunas, deep breathing exercises, sensory deprivation tanks, and anything that stimulates your parasympathetic nervous system and allows you to enter recovery mode. Each of these requires a bit of trial and error because people vary between what they find relaxing, as well as the amount of time and days per week seeking out these recovery methods will also vary depending on the amount of stress in your life because it will differ from person to person. Okay, we've spent a lot of time balancing out this equation with particular emphasis on the recovery. But how can you run faster without overdoing the training load part of the equation? Well, you need to be very strategic and carefully structure your training week with the right workouts. Luckily, this video will give you practical steps you need to run faster without the high risk of training overload. Click on it now and I'll see you there.